Good day. Um, I'm here with Pedro Kraus. Uh, I know Pedro, of course, for many years, and it's really a pleasure to interview him about uh, his career, his, where he's coming from, and his view on mycology. So, Pedro, start. When were you, or where were you born, and how did you come to mycology? Oh, gosh. Um, so, I'm uh, originally from South Africa. Uh, I was born in Cirrus in the Western Cape. And um, after school, I uh, went to study at the University of Stellenbosch. And <clears throat> my first degree was a forestry degree because I wanted to do something green. And um, uh, we had some practical where I had to dissect a frog. And I decided it's definitely not medicine. I'm sticking to the green part of uh, biology. It was so, a green frog. Uh, no, it was a green frog, <laughs> a dirty frog. But uh, yeah, so uh, that didn't work. So <clears throat> I studied forestry. And then um, uh, the first practical I had as a forestry student, I knew that this is not for me. You know, this is really boring. I'm, I'm not into this. Um, but I also then didn't know what I was going to do. So one day I was sitting. I remember I, I was surfing all morning and uh, so I was really tired, had a late night of parties. So I was sleeping in the class and then this guy came in who just got his PhD in America, in Minnesota, and it was Mike Wingfield. And he started lecturing on forest pathology. <clears throat> Halfway through the lecture I woke up and I saw all these fungal images and I thought, good God, you know, this is amazing stuff. And I, I specifically remember the fungus. It was Rhizina undulata, which you get around the pine forest uh, if there was a fire. And I was looking at this and I thought, wow. So after the lecture, I went to him and I said, you know, um, uh, Dr. Wingfield, I want to do this. So he said, no, 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 <laughs> you must first finish your degree. So I had another two, three years because I was second year then. And after that, I could go to him and uh, then I could uh, start a career as forest mycologist or forest pathologist actually. And that was still in Stellenbosch? <coughs> it was still in Stellenbosch. Okay. And Mike was working at um, a Plant Protection Research Institute and I had exactly this much bench space in one of his labs where I could work. And there was of course no money so he used to go on trips all over and when he came back he collected leaves of different trees so i started working on foliar pathogens of uh, trees and uh, i'm still doing that <laughs> so how many years ago was that well that was in 83 83 yeah so it's 25 years ago or more than that yeah yeah, yeah a long time so, yeah I, I i'm always impressed that you you you're still what I call the a very traditional mycology. You collect and then you start isolating. You go with your binocular and look where it is and so on. I think that that work is hardly done anymore in mycology. Or, or do you think that's... Well, I um, think it's very unique <coughs> that you have a fungus and then you start with the DNA. And, and many people just start with the DNA and do not look to the fungus. Well. Uh, What's fortunate in my case is that I'm now working at the Westerdijk Institute, uh, Fungal Biodiversity Institute in the Netherlands, uh, which has got this uh, massive culture collection. So it fits into the vision uh, of the Institute to get all these diverse species into the collection. So I think if, if I were to have worked at a university where I had to do a specific project, it would have been far more difficult to do this species discovery kind of work but uh, it, it fits in our mission and as you know there's just millions of species out there and they need to be cultured and they need to be preserved so that they can be used for uh, the benefit of humanity so i think within that niche i'm very comfortable and it's very um, fortunate that I'm able to do this. It's, it's, a, it's a real privilege and uh, it's truly incredible. I really love it. But uh, yes, I think both we think it's still uh, important to do this, but there are many mycologists saying, well, this old stuff, you know, you, you should really go only for the DNA or pyro sequencing, all, all the metagenomics. Um, I believe that we still owe this, the society to, to describe species and to find them and, and, and <coughs> monograph them. I, I think this is still important.
but I see also that it's becoming very difficult. In our place where we, we are working in the Westerdijk Institute, that's possible. But in other places, like in the United States, I think they're not really the same uh, mycology as we do in uh, Holland, uh, isn't it? it? it is a, no, there's a big difference. But I think we need to have the balance between species discovery and understanding species processes. Um, so there, uh, many people, many of colleagues that are here at this meeting, will probably spend their whole career working on a species or on an aspect of a species. So there also needs to be people that puts this taxon into a, a larger perspective. Um, just this morning I was listening to some amazing talks about uh, uh, fungal pathogens with different populations and uh, they're producing different toxins, they're doing different things. But when you see the phylogenetic trees, you know that these are different species. But uh, because these people come from a more plant pathological uh, perspective, they think that it's one big diverse population which is specialized to different hosts. So there's a, a real need for a collaborative approach between the, let's say, traditional mycologist or the phylogeneticist and uh, the more uh, plant pathological or applied um, uh, fungal biologists. And uh, together, I think it, it makes the whole picture. Uh, individually, it, it would be a big waste and uh, one would never get to the answer of how it all ties together. Yeah, well, well finding and, and working on the biodiversity, particularly with cultures and so, uh, you agree also that the Nagoya protocol really is a difficult issue for us, isn't it? Um, I was just uh, at lunch now discussing with Bevan Weir from um, New Zealand and uh, uh, New Zealand didn't sign the Nagoya protocol, but they're getting lots of cultures in that were collected in countries that did sign the protocol. This is, this is a huge hurdle for collaboration and for research. As you know, we also have this citizen science project working on uh, isolating fungi from soil and then describing and naming these fungi after the kids that collected the soil samples. And we want to take this project globally. And the big hurdle is that um, in many of these countries, Nagoya will make it impossible to, to do this work in a collaborative fashion. So I think it's a, it's a real pity. Obviously, um, there must be protection for uh, revenues of biodiversity for the specific countries, but um, it shouldn't be as it is now where it inhibits collaboration and just basic research. But don't you think that uh, the benefits or particularly the financial benefits for, for all the fe uh, fungi is not very well uh, overestimated because you find the fungus which is beautiful and uh, probably has no real properties for biotechnology and many of those are uh, the, these kind of fungi. And therefore, uh, yes, I believe that many countries are really prohibiting, uh, let's say, more research in biodiversity because they believe that every fungus is gold, which I don't believe. No, no, uh, that's, a, that's a real issue. The next big hurdle is going to be DNA because yeah. now they want to include that in Nagoya as well, which would make any kind of uh, phylogenetic research uh, uh, almost impossible to do. So I don't know what the answer is. Obviously, uh, a lot of developing countries see this as a potential cash crop. And um, again, I believe that there should be a benefit uh, sharing, but it should be in a way that it doesn't uh, hinder normal uh, research uh, to understand the biodiversity that we have on the planet. And there lies the uneasy balance. Yeah, you, you were just mentioning the citizen project and uh, I think for uh, uh, it was a very good initiative you did in, in Hall. Maybe you can explain a little bit more how you how we we did this and what kind of impact it had because it had a big impact. <coughs> it had it? a tremendous impact. So basically, this is linked to a, a, a museum, and um, the next museum we will do this with will be Micropia, and basically, groups of school children come to the museum and then they get a kit which consists of two test tubes. They take this home and they basically uh, collect soil in their gardens. Uh, this soil is then uh, sent back 
uh, via airmail to, to the institute. We isolate the, the fungi and if they're new species, we describe it after the kids. Um, obviously, these fungi could then also still be used. Some of them may produce an interesting metabolite that can, can be useful, maybe a new antibiotic, who knows. But they're in the collection, they preserve for prosperity. Um, but the, the children are incredibly excited by this, having your own fungus, a fungus that's named after you uh, for, for something that you collected in your garden. This is uh, actually quite, uh, quite interesting. So now we, um, uh, we were a bit shocked finding so many new species in the Netherlands because we had Walter Gums there and he looked extensively at Dutch soils and thought that it's all done. Well, it's not. There is a lot of new things and I think it's like that the world over. So next we want to, um, in 2019, extrapolate this to the Dutch islands and then we want to, in 2020, uh, take this globally uh, where we can get uh, permission uh, from the Nagoya uh, permits, etc. Um, but then uh, in the build up to the IMC 12 in Amsterdam in 2022, I can see the podium with children from various countries all over the world and we'll fly them in, just one representative per country and uh, this will be linked to a bigger symposium in their home countries where all the kids will get their certificates and the fungi named after them. So I think um, this will be a really big press moment that you can be there on the stage and there will be kids from say Kenya and uh, New Zealand and uh, Madagascar and whatever uh, next to a, a, a kid from Canada and they all have their new species and wondering whose fungus has got the magic bullet yeah, yeah. you know so but it's, it's uh, important that, that you bring mycology to the children and they start really uh, let's say enthusiastic about this field and maybe are interested to do the study because that there is not really particularly in Holland not very many mycologists uh, mycology students so maybe that that will really no, influence it, it, it's true look mycology as a discipline is not being taught in many countries of the world but we are using the fungi as a vehicle to expose children to biology and um, many of these children may one day choose for a career in biology, whatever they end up doing, it need not be with fungi, but the fungi are the vehicle and um, this is really uh, great because they become ambassadors to understand biodiversity on the planet and to protect the world as we know it. So I think there's a much bigger message in all of this and the benefits for humanity are there for all to enjoy afterwards. So yeah. it's really great. I remember that uh also the president of the academy sent a sample from her garden and you found a new species in her garden isn't it when we started the project um, the president of the royal dutch academy of arts and science uh, um, joseph van dijk uh, started the initiative with a sample from her garden in amsterdam and i know that joseph van dijk uh, her hero in life her idol is uh, Johanna Westerdijk, to which our, uh, we named the institute after uh, Johanna Westerdijk. And Westerdijk has a genus called Westerdijk Kella, which was um, described uh, from soil collected in Mozambique uh, by a Dutch mycologist, Harry Swart, who later became the mycologist in Melbourne in, in Australia. But um, so with, fun, uh, with Josie van Dijk, she's now got van Dijk Keller and, uh, as a new genus in her soil. It's also a new family. So uh, who would have thought this in her garden in Amsterdam? And what I didn't tell her is that there's many more species in her soil. So hopefully this year we'll get to naming them as well. So yeah. incredible biodiversity. Well, while you're, you're mentioning uh, all the, let's say, the, the, the relation with South Africa. You're from so South Africa yourself. Uh, in, in the meantime, you, you, you got the uh, Dutch citizenship, but I think that the, the um, relation between the Wesserdijk Institute and South Africa was really intense uh, in, in, let's say, particularly in the 70s and the 80s, isn't it? And before, in fact, because Wesserdijk also sent her students or, or her yes, post I was, um, I was actually uh, uh, in South Africa a month ago and I took several posters to South Africa of the uh, Westerdijk family tree. And this family tree is, um, is all her PhD students. So she had 56 PhDs and these students again had PhDs. So there's a whole family hierarchy. And um, 
Uh, one of these was Susara Truter, who after the Second World War went back to South Africa and she became the first female dean of agriculture in the world. But she uh, became professor, uh, dean and head of department of microbiology and she had lots of PhDs who again got PhDs. And these, many of them are now professor at the University of Pretoria, the University of the Free State, University of Natal, University of Stellenbosch, and all of them are having students again. So actually the Vesterdijk family tree is growing faster in South Africa than it is in the Netherlands. Yeah. So it's, it's truly well, global. It's, it's funny, I, I, I just had an interview with, uh, with Mike Wingfield and I, I asked him about the future of uh, the uh, mycology in South Africa. He said, well, th there are many uh, new people which, which in fact uh, were from, from, from this professor from Wesserdijk. But he said, uh, it, it is also remarkable that internationally we all work together, the South African. And uh, we are producing like hell. Uh, don't you think that this is really a remarkable uh, development in mycology? It, 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 it truly is. So I think this year, uh, Clavariate analysis produced the first analysis of universities globally rated according to discipline. And in the field of mycology, the University of Pretoria, where Mike Wingfield is, is rated number two in the world. Whoa. And I think Wagenen was number three and Utrecht was number five. So the Dutch heritage is massive uh, internationally. And uh, most or much of this can be traced back again to Westerdijk and the legacy of one woman and a world to work on fungi. It's, yeah. it's truly amazing. It's already a few years ago that you came to Holland. Did you uh, regret something that you came to Holland? The weather maybe or? <laughs> <laughs> I, I miss the weather from Africa and I miss real mountains. That, that I regret. But uh, for the rest, I think it's a, it's, it's a wonderful uh, place to live and uh, uh, it's an incredible place for research. So that has been uh, really good. And one can have ample trips to um, Africa and other countries where one can co collect amazing biodiversity. But as we've seen with citizen science, there's even a lot of biodiversity in the Netherlands yeah, yeah, waiting yeah. to be described. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, we are here at IMC 11 and uh, you, you, are going to, or you have already started IMC 12 in Amsterdam. Uh, can you say something about your plans with, with this Congress? Well, uh, um, IMC 12 will be in 2022 in the Rye and um, the theme is from biodiversity to applications. It's going to be a massive meeting. We reckon it's, it's probably going to be one of the largest, if not the largest IMC ever. Why do you so, think that? Uh, because uh, we will have uh, more workshops than have ever been planned at any IMC. Um, and a lot of these people come to this meeting not only for the lectures, but specifically for the added value. Really qualitative, uh, great focused workshops on various aspects in biodiversity, in food, in health, in industry. And uh, we are already planning how to do this and to place this as pre and post conference workshop. So I think we, we um, will have a, a, a massive interest for this. We will also have more money for student bursaries than any uh, Congress had before. So we're going to bring in lots of students from developing countries. Um, we'll work on getting cheaper accommodation, etc. So I think we've got the, the cornerstones of a really successful meeting. So we also give the opportunity to a lot of students to give oral presentation rather than uh, posters. We and this is important. Yeah, 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 I think so. We have realized that in many countries uh, students can only get permission to attend if they can actually talk. So we'll uh, try and be creative with the program, maybe going for shorter talks but more talks so that more students can get uh, the chance to be exposed to the scientific community. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I, I will uh, uh, end this uh, conversation about publications because <laughs> we, we both know that publication is very important uh, but um, I see that there are problems. Uh, you, you can fight with impact factors. Uh, and then you see that uh, many journals are, in fact, rejecting papers because it's just only species or a genus description. 
you, you have just established a, a new journal. Uh, is that why is that? Why, why did you uh, establish that journal? Well, we just established FUSE, uh, Fungal Systematics and Evolution, specifically aimed at uh, um, uh, data release papers, but in our case these data release papers are uh, new species descriptions. Uh, we find that in many cases that people collect species and um, there's not a specific story behind it. They, they have it and they knew and they need to be published and released to the uh, community. And uh, many journals do not want to do this because they think the paper will not be highly cited. And then the researchers don't publish the species. So we want to provide an easy platform to enable them to do this because I think that many of these species will end up being valuable in any case and the papers will get cited. So I am not worried at all about uh, uh, impact uh, factor. Biodiversity takes care of that itself it, and as long as there's good standards and the tax are described in, in the best gold standard techniques of the day, it will all take care of itself. But we need to uh, lower the hurdle for species discovery and uh, publication. Yeah, what, what do you think about uh, the topic biodiversity in this Congress? Do you think there should be more biodiversity? You, you like to do it in Amsterdam, isn't it? Yes, yes. Well, we, we, uh, we think that, that uh, biodiversity is one of the five themes okay. in, yeah. in, in the, the IMC Congress. And the IMC Congresses are always balanced because they cover all aspects of fungal biology. So, um, but when the, the Congress is, say, in Asia, like it was in, in, in Thailand in uh, uh, 2014, then biodiversity has a more impetus than year in, in, in Puerto Rico because of the um, Congress priorities organized by the uh, Mycological Society of America. They're more into metagenomics, so biodiversity, but in a different perspective than what you would have, say, in Asia or what you would have in Europe. Yeah. Okay, um, yeah, we both worked at the Westerdijk Institute. Uh, I still, in my head, still uh, call it CBS. CBS, yeah. yeah. Um, I had a great uh, career there, 48 years. Um, so, um, how do you see the future of our institute? I think that the future of the institute is better than ever before because we have a balance between groups that are doing biodiversity discovery and that are doing more applied research. And the institute is more relevant than ever before in the niches agriculture, uh, health and industry. And there's very strong financial support from these industries and other than this, the relevance of what we do. The relevance is so incredible to all these sectors that uh, it's so easy to justify the institute, what it is and what it stands for. Um, we, are in, um, we are now going to invest more heavily in, in certain areas, for instance, clinical diagnostics. I just heard this week that the new hospitals that are being built around the institute will be establishing clinical mycology groups. Uh -huh. So these groups will link to those in the institute and the whole hub will be uh, far stronger. This is something we would never have dreamt of 10 years ago. But because of the relevance, because of the new types of uh, treatments and the immune system gets suppressed and the fungi are becoming much more important. Um, resistance to, to fungicides, uh, new infections, untreated infections. So uh, the fungi uh, are really very important and will be getting more attention in years to come. Yeah, and, and we are lucky that we are in the Netherlands with all these institutes, the network. I think that, uh, let's say, networking and cooperation within Netherlands is, uh, is, is excellent. And of course, uh, we are fully supported by the academy. And I think that's also important. If you see all the, the problems in other institutions now in Denmark and so on, they, they, they have really big problems to get money. But I, I'm very happy that, uh, that, that you are now in an institute which is really having seen a very bright future. Yes, I think so. I, I think as long as you uh, stay to, to, uh, to what you do and do that to the best of your ability and you link that to relevance, you will be okay regardless of where you are in the world. Okay. Thank you, Pedro, for Thank this you, nice uh, congress. Okay.